A homeless patient with severe liver disease demands to be discharged from the hospital despite receiving life-saving treatment. Explain how to assess capacity in this patient. It's important that we first understand what we mean by capacity. So this refers to the patient's ability to understand, retain, weigh up pros and cons and come to a decision and relay this effectively. So there are a few steps that you would take to ensure a patient has capacity. The first one being to check their understanding. So it's important that the patient can comprehend the nature of their condition. And in this scenario with the patient having a severe liver disease, it's important that they understand the severity of their condition as well. An effective way to check this would be to ask the patient to explain their condition back to you. And I would need to make sure that the patient is able to retain this information for a certain period of time. This just is just to ensure that the patient is able to come to an informed decision. They would then need to be able to weigh up pros and cons. So they would need to be able to weigh up the pros of receiving this life-saving treatment and the risks and consequences if they, of, if they don't receive this life-saving treatment. Finally, the patient would need to be able to come to a decision and relay this effectively. It's important to also consider medical ethics in this scenario because it's important to acknowledge that a patient has autonomy. So this is the ability of a patient to make choices about their own healthcare. And it's important that as healthcare professionals, we respect this choice. However, it's also super important that we ensure that there is nothing impacting this. There's no factors impacting this, such as their mental health, if they're having delirium or anything, any other factors that could impact this. It's also important to ensure that we act in the patient's best interest. So ensure that the patient is provided with all the necessary support they need. It would be also good to explore any reasons as to why this patient may not want this surgery, in the, this life-saving treatment in the first place. So, and address any concerns they may have. Also, it would be super beneficial to work with the patient to come to a common goal. So express that you also want them to be discharged but safely and work together with the patient on that. If even after all these conversations um, exploring their reasons as to why they don't want to receive this life-saving treatment and the patient is still adamant that they don't want to receive it, provided that they are competent, it ultimately would have to respect patient autonomy and the patient's choice in this scenario and allow them to be discharged without receiving the life-saving treatment but not before we've it, exhausted all other options and ensure that they have received all the support they need, all the information they need, and that we've explored fully why they don't want that treatment. Explore the ethical implications of genetic testing in minors, especially when the test results could reveal information about late onset conditions. So when we think about genetic testing, we are referring to analysis of DNA to identify any changes or mutations that could indicate the presence or risk of certain genetic conditions. So when we're talking about late onset conditions, these are conditions that typically manifest later on in life, so things like cancers, and we're testing minors, so we would assume that this is anyone under the age of 18. One of the biggest concerns that we would have when carrying out genetic testing in minors is that is it actually in the best interest of the child? Would it do more harm than good? Because if it's something that you can catch and then provide the child with lifestyle changes or put in preventative measures that can help prevent that disease, then it could be super beneficial for the child. However, if it's something like Huntington's disease where there's no preventative practices or no cure for the condition, it can actually do more harm than good and also make leave the patient feeling helpless and cause psychological distress and other issues. So it's important to consider if this is actually in the best interest of the patient. So it's also important to consider non-maleficence in this scenario. So non-maleficence means to do no harm. It's one of the pillars of medical ethics. And genetic testing for late onset conditions can cause, can cause things like psychological distress, anxiety, social, social implications like discrimination so it's vital to consider whether these potential benefits outweigh the risks and if there is for instance a positive result for a condition with no current cure it could lead to unnecessary suffering and negative impacts on this child's life we are dealing with minors in this situation so we have to be very careful to respect patient autonomy but this can be difficult in the scenario where we are dealing with minors who may not be able to 
make a fully informed decision. So in this scenario, we would try and fully involve the child with the decision making process depending on their maturity levels but also because they are minors it's crucial that we get parents or guardians fully involved in that decision making process and with the whole testing process and make them aware and make them able to make the choices about everything as well. It's important that because we are dealing with such sensitive information that we provide the patients and families of those involved with any support they may need. So an ethics committee to provide unbiased opinions or course of action or psychological support, but any sort of support that we feel like the families or patients may need. And if we are providing them with information of for a late onset condition that can be prevented that we are doing all the necessary follow-ups providing them with the necessary support information that they're able to understand the condition how it can be prevented um, and make sure that that is all available to them ultimately it is important to ensure that these the potential um, benefits outweigh risks any potential risks and that the patients and families are fully supported during this process Evaluate the ethical implications of using prisoners as organ donors. So organ donors are people who donate their organs to others with issues with their own organs or have failing organs and are in need of a new one. And when we think about prisoners, it's people who are incarcerated due to committing criminal offences. So there are a few ethical considerations to think about when using prisoners as organ donors. So respect for autonomy. This is a fundamental principle acknowledging and supporting an individual's right to make fully informed decisions about their own body. So in a prisoner's case, this can already be, feel quite restricted due to them being incarcerated. So ensuring that prisoners can freely choose to donate their organs without being pressured by their circumstances or any authorities can be quite challenging. The decision must be voluntary and informed. So it's important to also consider beneficence. So this is to act in the best interest of the patient and the recipient. Organ donation is great. It can save lives. It can provide the recipient with significant health benefits. So if the prisoner does genuinely wish to donate an organ out of altruism, this act can be beneficial. However, it healthcare providers need to ensure that this is done with the prisoner's physical health in mind and as well as their well-being. They need to ensure that the donor is fit and healthy for organ donation in the first place. This is for both the health of the donor and the recipient and so that the donor wouldn't be put in harm's way and also making sure that they obviously are comp compatible. Using prisoners as organ donors can be quite challenging and raise potential concerns that they are being used as a means to an end. So it's crucial that prisoners are not disproportionately being targeted for their organs and their rights and dignity are being preserved. The use of restraints and seclusion in psychiatric patients raises ethical concerns. How would you approach the decision to use these interventions while safeguarding patients' rights? So when we think of restraints, it's something a physical method used to restrict a patient or seclusion where we're isolating this patient. It's important to consider autonomy in this situation. However, in context of psychiatric patients, autonomy is something that may be compromised due to the patient's mental state. So before any choice to use, before any choice or decision to use restraints or seclusion is made, it's important that the individual is assessed based on their capacity and where possible the patient should be involved in the in the decision making process and their consent and preferences should be sought in situations where it's not possible to include the patient in the in the decision making process it's important to involve family or anybody else involved in the patient's life with that decision making process and when thinking about beneficence, this involves acting in the best interest of the patient. So the primary goal of using a restraint or using restraints or seclusion should be to protect the patient from immediate harm and ensure their safety. So they should only be used when they're absolutely necessary and when less restrictive alternatives have been exhausted, such as verbal de-escalation of a scenario. The healthcare team should also ensure that they're continuously rechecking and reassessing the patient's condition and mental state to check if these restrictions are still warranted. 
as healthcare professionals, we have an obligation to avoid causing harm and restraints and seclusions used like this can have physical and psychological effects on patients such as fear, humiliation, and trauma. So it's important that it, these restraints are used as a last resort for these patients and that they also are provided with, the, with adequate support and debrief, debriefing after the use of these restraints. It's also important that the decision to use these restraints or seclusion is based on clinical need and it's fair and it's not based on any bias or discrimination and it's used and that there are policies put in place and that is used fairly amongst all patients. So these restraints or seclusion used um, on psychiatric patients should be used with careful consideration and with consideration of the ethical pillars in mind and ensuring that we do as minimal as minimal harm to the patient as possible. Discuss the ethical considerations surrounding the involvement of medical professionals in capital punishment. So capital punishment refers to the authorization, the legal authorization of the execution of an individual for as a penalty for a crime. So when we think about medical professionals, we their fundamental goal, their primary goal is to heal and take care of patients. Engaging in capital punishment directly contradicts this as it involves intentionally causing harm and not providing any benefit or care. This can actually undermine doctor-patient relationship and cause the public to lose trust in the medical profession. And this loss in doctor patient relationship can actually have a really negative impact because it can affect the care being provided for some people. For example, criminals, this may not in the future deter them from receiving health care because of medical professionals engaging in capital punishment. Also, involvement of medical professionals engaging in capital punishment can actually lead to more distress and psychological harm for themselves, leading to things like anxiety or PTSD from having to carry out something like this when they've been trained to save lives their whole to save lives for their whole career, not to end them. So this can this goes directly against all their core principles. Also a big aspect of care that doctors provide is very patient centred and this strays very far from that as it essentially is taking away human rights which healthcare professionals and doctors and nurses should be advocates for. Alternately medical professionals should refrain from participating in capital punishment and instead safeguard the medical profession and reinforce the societal trust that is placed in healthcare providers. Discuss the ethical aspects of medical paternalism when dealing with a non-compliant patient with a chronic condition. So medical paternalism refers to a practice where healthcare professionals make decisions for their patients, assuming that it is in their best interest, often overriding patients' own preferences. Now, one of the main pillars of medical ethics is autonomy, and this is the ability this is recognizing that patients have the ability to make their own choices about their healthcare. Now, when dealing with a non-compliant patient, this can be quite challenging as we have to respect that they can make their own choices even if it goes against what is medically advised and even though it may not be in their best interest. However, it also involves ensuring that the patient is fully informed about the conditions and all the treatment options available and the consequence and the potential consequences of their non-compliance. It would also be beneficial to explore reasons as to why the patient is not complying. Is it for religious reasons? Is it because they don't really understand the treatment options given it, given to them? Especially when dealing with a patient with a chronic condition, so this is a long lasting condition that requires ongoing management. So for example, a diabetic patient, they may require to take multiple pills throughout the day and that could and they may not notice like they're having any physical effects on their body so that could lead to them not being compliant so exploring reasons as to why they're not being compliant and addressing any of those concerns and trying to tackle it that way so medical paternalism can sometimes be justified under the principle of beneficence so this is to act in the patient's best interest so when a medical professional believes that a treatment plan would be better for an individual because it would result in better health outcomes for this patient 
even if it overrides patient preferences, but it's important to balance this with the patient's right to make their own choices. So also medical paternalism may be the best option in cases where patients may lack capacity so they're not able to make informed decisions about their own health and this is when you would work together possibly with the family and the multidisciplinary team in working to find out the best course of action for this patient ensuring it is in the best interest of the patient and doesn't cause them any harm or distress. Medical paternalism can also be harmful if it undermines the patient's trust in their healthcare provider and this could negatively impact the doctor-patient relationship and defer patients from possibly seeking healthcare in the future if they feel like they are being forced to do something or they feel like their opinion wasn't valued. Also, when patients are involved with that decision-making process, they feel like their opinion is being, is being valued and they are more likely to adhere and be compliant with the treatment plan if they feel like their choices were taken into consideration. Care professionals also must ensure that their actions are motivated by the patient's best interests and not by any prejudiced views about the patient's behaviour or background. While healthcare professionals sometimes may feel justified in taking a paternalistic approach, it is, all, it is crucial that the patient's autonomy is respected and that their choices are valued and taken into consideration and this will ultimately lead to hopefully better adherence to the treatment plan. How can the NHS work to uphold a doctor's right to autonomy? So when we are discussing autonomy in doctors, this is referring to the ability of doctors to make to make decisions about patient care based on their professional judgment and expertise and ensuring that doctors have the autonomy to make these clinical decisions is crucial for maintaining high standards of patient care. The NHS can work to uphold, uphold this principle by providing a supportive work environment where doctors feel empowered to use their professional judgment without interference. So the NHS can work to do this by ensuring adequate staffing levels, fostering a culture of respect and trust in doctors' expertise, but also by providing opportunities for continuously allowing doctors to develop professionally. So making sure that they are staying informed about the latest medical advancements, possibly doing extra courses, things like that to stay on top of their medical knowledge. And this can enhance their ability to continue to make those clinical decisions for their patients. Also by upholding doctor's autonomy, it means that we, act, we can act in the best interests of both the patient and healthcare professionals because patient care decisions are being made by those who are most knowledgeable about individual cases. This can lead to better patient outcome and enhance job satisfaction for doctors. Also including them in policy making across the hospitals, ensuring that they can contribute to the overall healthcare system. The NHS needs to ensure that all doctors' autonomy, autonomy is respected regardless of their specialty or position and this can work to help create a better environment for doctors.